how to just join hands with somebody because I know that there are many needs in the house, many needs that we face. And I want us just to pray together in agreement. We have some things that we can stand upon in the Word. If you're sick in your body, the Word says, by His stripes we're healed. If you're facing disappointment, if you're facing depression and fear and all those things that we go through in life, we have His covenant that says, you have hope in Christ. In Him you live. In Him you move. In Him you have your being. And then if you're going through things that you just don't understand, we have an anchor. Anchor for our soulless man, our mind, our will, our emotion. Just that anchor is called Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's just agree right now that the presence of God will be manifested to meet every single need in this house today because that's just how big God is. Amen? Father, we just say thank you because we know we can call upon you in time of need. And we know, Lord, that you hear us. You said if we ask anything according to your will, you hear us. And if you hear us, then we also know that we have the petition that we ask of you. So, Father, we know it's your will to heal. It's your will to deliver. It's your will to save. It's your will to give peace. So we declare it in the name of Jesus that your Holy Spirit is doing the work that only you can do in each heart and each life. And the peace of God that passes all understanding is ruling our hearts and ruling our minds. And the healing virtue of Jesus flows through our bodies so that you may be glorified. And Father, we give you praise because your word works and we trust you, we believe you, and we receive it in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, you said amen. amen. God bless you. You can be seated if you want to. You don't have to, just if you want to. Wow. Well, today, today is a special day. We're going to be having uh, an opportunity to catch the vision of the Gideon ministry around the world today, and it's good to have our guest with us. We're going to be introducing him in just a little bit. It's, uh, it's good to be a part of something that we can be involved, involved in sharing the word around the world. I remember a few years ago we were in India, stayed at a hotel in Hyderabad, India, and there was a Gideon Bible right there. In English, actually. It was good. It's just amazing how God has used this ministry to touch the lives of people. We're going to be hearing some testimonies in a little bit about that. We're going to give you opportunity now to give, worship the Lord with your giving. I want you to keep in mind that in a little while we're going to receive a second offering for the Gideon ministry, so kind of keep that in mind and plan on that. God has been good to us as a church. God has blessed us. God has given us vision. He's given us a heart to reach out. And the amazing thing is, this is just such a, a wonderful family. I mean, just a, a group of people that just, we love one another in spite of ourselves. And we've been through a lot. And we still love one another. Amen. God is just good. I believe it's because we believe the Word. And when you believe the Word, that's what you do. You love God and you love people. But we have, uh, we're getting close to having our kids' building finished. Ah. And the kids are going to have fun, but I am too. I can't wait. We're, when, once we get the carpet in, we're going to kind of go over there and have a special dedication time for the building. And if you haven't been over to look it over, when you get time after the service, go by, just go over there and kind of walk through it and look at the changes that are happening over there. And it's looking good. We've got uh, plans to do some more work on the back part of the building. And, and actually, we're wanting to uh, enclose where the concrete slab is back there and close that area for a temporary facility for storing our food for the food giveaways. And then we've got vision to build the new food warehouse, and I believe that's coming. How many of you believe that's coming? Hold your hand up a little bit longer. How many of you believe that's coming? All right, I'm going to ask you to give like you believe it's coming then. All right. Amen. We're so blessed to be involved in so many areas of ministry, and it's through faithfulness of people like you that the kingdom does increase. Bishop uh, 
Sudhir Mahanti is going to be with us in two weeks. And if you haven't heard him, you need to make plans to be here. If you have heard him, I know you'll be back. He has a great heart for the kingdom of God. He is our, our ministry that we support in India, and it's going to be a good time. So keep that in mind. At this time, if the ushers will come, we're going to give everybody an opportunity to give. We encourage you to worship the Lord in your giving. We don't give out of compulsion. We don't give out of necessity. And we don't give just because there is a need. Although we as believers have this thing that works in us where we just find a need and we want to meet it. That's because that's who we are. But when we give today, we give to worship the Lord, to honor Him. Because in the book of Hebrews, the Word of God says that Jesus is our high priest. And He goes before the Father. And he said, that high priest himself must have something to offer in the true tabernacle that's in the heavenly realm. So what we have, we give to the Lord Jesus, our high priest, and he takes whatever we give, offers it to the Father. The Father receives it. The Father blesses it, multiplies it, gives it back to us because he doesn't need it. And it's an act of worship. So I encourage you to express your heart of worship to the Lord today as you give in honor of him. Father, we say thank you for the privilege we have to give to you. We declare, Lord, that you are the supplier of every need that we have. And because we can put you first, you said if we seek you first, everything else is added. We honor you with our substance. We bring the first fruits of our life to you. And we know, Lord, that you receive it and you bless it, you multiply it, and you give it back. We thank you, Lord, because we have a heart for the kingdom to increase. We have a heart for seed to be planted so that you can be glorified in our lifestyle and in the lives of those that we give to. May your will in heaven be done to us and through us today as we worship you in our giving and we do it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you as you give today. We have, uh, I'm going I'm to share with you right now while they're receiving the offer, I'm going to share with you our life rule for the week. Many of you know that we, uh, we go through one life rule, my personal life rules. I've got 52 of them, so there's one for every week of the year. And I want to ask you to make a note of this life rule. This one's kind of a tough one for some people. It's life rule number 43. Rejoice in the success and blessings of others, even when you don't feel successful or blessed yourself before you can be celebrated you must celebrate the success of others it's a law of sowing and reaping many people when they see the success of others you become envious and you become jealous of what they have accomplished but i've discovered a principle in the kingdom that if you will rejoice with them then at some point in time, somebody will rejoice with you over your blessings. So make a note. Rejoice in the success and blessings of others, even when you don't feel successful or blessed yourself. Wow. Before you can be celebrated, you must celebrate the success of others. All right. Got that down? All right. Another announcement. We are doing a teaching on Wednesday night, and we've talked about moving out of spiritual dryness. And uh, you see, if there's anything that's true in the world today is people that call themselves believers many times are just dry. They don't have a heart. They're not on fire. They don't have a, a drive. They're not motivated to hear the word, do the word, obey the word. And so there's some things that we can talk about. We've been talking about on Wednesday night about what is involved in moving out of that spiritual dry, dry experience. We know that there's no such thing as spiritual burnout. If you burn out, it's not because your spirit is burned up. It's because your flesh is in the way. And so be here Wednesday night. We're going to do a little teaching on that. And then uh, I know that you will be blessed in that. All right, tomorrow night, the men or the men and the women, everybody's getting together tomorrow night for a, a meeting at 6.30, 6 o'clock. Six, somebody tell me when. 6 o'clock. 
and we're going to make plans for our big uh, lawnmower race and car show. I didn't even know there was such a thing as lawnmower races until last year. Well, I knew there had to be something, you know, there's everything in the world, but I'd never seen one. And I tell you what, Sylvester has got a lawnmower. He mowed the yard with it this week. Him and Renee, they just, it's such a blessing. But his lawnmower goes fast. I mean, he's got one that, if you've never seen a lawnmower race, you need to be here this coming Saturday. I'm telling you, it's going to be a sight to see. I think one of them last year, I think it looked like, sounded like it had a jet engine on it. I don't know. I mean, those things can move. So we're going to have a blast, and then we're going to have a car show. And I think, uh, uh, Wayne, did you say, what, about 25 cars going to be here? Classic cars going to be here. We're going to, and, and Kim has already asked Wayne to take her for a ride in his Corvette. Hundred and seventy miles an hour. How fast will it go? Two hundred? It'll go two hundred miles an hour. John, how fast will your car go? About one ninety five. Oh, you can be, he's gonna beat you then. Yeah. Uh, you think we could get the, the highway patrol to help us here and, and <laughs> Yeah. Wow. I remember my brother had a road runner. I've had that one about 160. I've been in John's. It was almost that fast, wasn't it? Yeah, 158. Yeah, so that's 200. Okay. I'm thinking through this. Just give me a minute, okay? Be here Saturday. We're going to have a blast. It's going to be fun. Hamburgers, hot dogs, all the fixings, and we're going to have a lot of fellowship, and we're going to pray that it doesn't rain a whole lot, just a little bit. Praise God for cooler weather coming. Amen? All right, today we're going to take time to acknowledge what the Lord is doing around the world with the Gideons. And we have a brother with us, Ivan Chester. Come on up here and share. Take your freedom and your liberty. We're going to be lo looking at a video here in a little bit. He's going to share his heart. And I encourage you to catch the vision. Amen. Thank you for Thank being you with us Maxwell. today. It is a privilege and honor to be here today. Linda and I are from Mullen, Texas, member of First Baptist Church, Mullen. You know, I want to take just a minute here to comment on this 200 miles an hour. <laughs> wow. You know, when I was 21, I had a 63 Ford police interceptor engine. Yeah, yeah. It had 120 on the speedometer, but I seen it go way past that. Yeah, yeah. And I tell you what. It's a wonder God had to take me up to heaven. <laughs> I'm here by the grace of God. I want to share a bit of testimony that I hadn't planned this morning. Prayed for this young life. And Brother Maxwell said God has a purpose for him. Amen. Let me tell you, I grew up in Mullen, Texas on a farm. Sheep and cattle. And then my daddy got chickens. We had 10,000 laying hens. I knew I didn't want to be a chicken farmer. <laughs> but you're hearing the son of a chicken farmer this morning. Let me tell you, God can use the son of a chicken farmer. I spent seven years out at 3M 
One day I saw a commercial about computer repairmen. I knew I wanted to be a computer repairman. I went to school, had the opportunity to work on the computers that sent our first spacecraft to the moon. Got to see the Apollo craft in person right there. I retired about 15 years ago. I thought, this is it, God, you've used me. You know, he sent me the Gideons. He said, I can use you as a Gideon. Yeah. Let me tell you, God can use you, man. We need Gideons. If you feel led, talk to me afterwards. I'd love to talk with you about being a Gideon. I want to tell you about a little bit about the story of the Gideons this morning. In July of 1899, three men anxiously waited in the parlor of a YMCA in Janesville, Wisconsin. I can see them pacing back and forth on a hot Saturday afternoon, waiting anxiously. They were there to meet other businessmen for the possibility of forming a new group of Christian traveling businessmen. They were feeling uncertain. It was only 34 years after the end of the Civil War, a very uncertain time. One year earlier, two of these men had met in a hotel. When John Nicholson tried to check in, the clerk said, we have no more rooms. But there is a man up on the second floor where there's two beds, Sam Hill, and he's willing to share. That night as John settled in, he looked over at Sam and says, you know, I make a habit of reading God's word before I retire. Sam says, I'm a Christian too, and if you don't mind, I'd like to join you. Together, they read from John 15, 16, which says, You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that fruit should remain, that whatsoever you shall ask of the Father in my name, he will give to you. They spent a lot of time that night talking about that verse <clears throat> and what it meant. Excuse me. Sometimes when I sing a lot, I lose my voice here. They decided that God wanted them to do something. They prayed about it. They talked about it. They said, you know, we need an organization for traveling businessmen so that we could meet and worship together. We'd know one another. They decided right then that they would start such an organization. They decided to meet again in one year. They, as they traveled through that year, they invited other friends and businessmen to come and be a part of this new organization. When John Nicholson returned home, he asked his friend William J. Knight to be a part of this. William Knight sent out letters but no one came. Not one other person. These three men simply opened in prayer and called the order, called to order the first meeting of a yet unnamed organization. John Knight says, you know, the name, the Christian Commercial Traveling Men's Association is just too complicated, too long. We're businessmen. We need something short, something to get your attention. They agreed to bow in prayer, and the first one to come up with a name would shout it aloud. It was William J. Knights who shouted out Gideons. They opened their Bibles and read how God used Gideon and how Gideon obeyed even when he did not understand. He had a lot of questions, but he still obeyed God's command. So they decided to call this new organization the Gideons. They set their next meeting for two months. 
September 1st, 1899, in a YMCA in Wakusa, Wisconsin. More letters were sent. They continued to invite their friends as they traveled. At this Friday night meeting, several other businessmen showed up. They were interested in finding out about this new organization of traveling businessmen. These 12 men became the charter members of the, of the Gideons. Over the next few years, the organization grew. The first convention was held in Wakugan, Illinois on Saturday, June 30th, 1900. There were only 37 members present, but newspapers began to talk about <clears throat> these new, this new organization of Christian traveling businessmen called Gideons. It began to grow and grow it wasn't until the convention of 1907 that W.W. Kissinger of Austin, Texas, said we need to focus our efforts in putting a Bible in every hotel room. The first placement was in Superior, Illinois, in the Superior Hotel. <clears throat> the date was November 9th, 1908. In July of 1909, at their second convention, they had distributed 5,774 Bibles. With Texas leading the way, we had 1,389 Bibles distributed in Texas. Hotel Bibles were very well received. We got lots of cards thanking us for those Bibles. <clears throat> One hotel owner sarcastically added to his note, I have one objection to your Bibles. Since you've placed these Bibles in my hotel, my light bill's gone up 50%. <laughs> Praise the Lord. By January of 1929, the one millionth Bible had been placed reaching not only the United States, but 13 foreign countries. <clears throat> In January of 1941, Gideons began distributing, got to get this Bible out of my pocket, little New Testaments to our military. Just five weeks prior to the attack at Pearl Harbor, they began distributing 40,000 military New Testaments. In the back is the plan of salvation and a place to write their names they accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord. We finished that distribution just five days before that fatal attack. The story is told of one nurse there at Pearl Harbor who was called to identify the body of her son. She was given his belongings among which she found a little Gideon New Testament. She quickly opened to the back cover and found he had signed his name, accepting Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. She said, as she signed her name, right below his, someday we'll meet again. Many New Testaments were found. Two of those soldiers, military men, had accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. A soldier wrote to the Gideons from somewhere in Italy. He wrote, I'm writing to thank you for the New Testament, which I have received from the chaplain. It's helping me a lot. When I was back home, I didn't pay too much attention to religion. But when you get in a tight spot like I am right now, things change. I have been in this foxhole all day reading this little New Testament. The shells are landing pretty close. But Jesus said, if you believe in him, he's, a, he's my protector. He will take care of me. I feel that hope right now. I hope this letter helps someone else. Distribution to schools, we distribute this little New Testament to our schools began 
with 300 New Testaments distributed in Wheaton, Illinois in 1946. Many times a single New Testament will touch the lives of many people. Nineteen sixty nine was a tumultuous year. It was a year that's nineteen sixty eight, let me get it right. Somebody's gonna correct me here if I don't. It was a tumultuous year, the year of the assassination of Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy and Robert F. Kennedy. The Apollo spacecraft was scheduled to become the first man made object. Man May, man, anyway, <laughs> first spacecraft with men aboard to leave the orbit of the Earth and go around the moon. A press conference was held a few weeks prior to the launch, and a reporter asked, is there some kind of religious or Christian uh, gesture you're going to make while you're circling? the moon. Commander Frank Borman thought about that. He couldn't come up with anything, so he hired a professional writer, Joe Latine. Joe Latine spent several days trying to come up with something that they could say or read as they orbited the moon. That would really reflect the creation in God and Christmas. He was desperate. He reached over to his desk and found he had a Gideon Bible, which he had borrowed from a hotel room. We don't mind if you borrow them. We check them regularly. If you need a Bible, please take it. As he opened up the Bible, his wife said, look at Genesis chapter 1. When his eyes fell on that passage of the creation, he knew that was the story that would be read as they orbited the moon. That night, 9.30 Eastern time, as they orbited the moon, the Apollo 8 crew would read from God's word the story of the creation of the world. It's estimated that uh, one million people would read, would see one billion, let me get that right too, over 64 countries would hear God's word read that night. Later that night, a Japanese reporter called the NASA Public Affairs and said, I'd like a transcript of that message that they read as they orbited the moon. The NASA official said, where are you staying? He replied with the name of a Houston hotel and said, the, uh, the NASA official said, Go to your bedside table, open up that drawer, and you'll find a Gideon Bible. Open it to Genesis chapter 1, and you'll have this transcript. You know, Gideon's currently distributed in over 200 countries in 107 different languages. You know, I've traveled a lot, and quite often, I find one in English in that drawer. It is amazing how much we have done. But I want to tell you one more story before I finish. Linda and I traveled to Sierra Leone, Africa on a mission trip with a group called International Commission. We do door-to-door -door witnessing I was with the pastor, Pastor Simeon. Linda was with two young men as they went door to door telling people about Jesus Christ. I had just witnessed to a young Muslim man about 22 or 23 years of age. He accepted Jesus Christ turning from his Muslim faith. The pastor was counseling him on baptism and church membership. As I picked up to leave, he said, Sir, do you have a Bible that I might have? 
I had planned to give Bibles, but they had not arrived. I began to explain to him that we wouldn't be back that way. We were going somewhere else the next day, and I didn't have a Bible. I haven't given him your Bible. Sierra Leone speaks English. He read English. He can understand English. But God, this is my Bible. I have my notes in here. I haven't given him your Bible. But God, how many Bibles do you have, Ivan? I quickly opened up my Bible, took out some personal things, and handed him this Bible. He hugged it to his chest and said, Now I can know more about Jesus. I returned back to the church that afternoon. There, sitting on the floor, were the cases of Bibles which I had ordered. I quickly opened up and got one that I might use for the rest of the week. As I did, one of the young men who had been witnessing all day said, Sir, may I have one of those Bibles? Yes, you may. But, but what have you been using all day to tell people about Jesus? Oh, I use this little card you gave me, sir. We had about 10 young men working with us. I took a poll and I found only one out of the 10 owned a Bible. I returned back to the United States and was telling my Sunday school class about this and one of my friends said, Ivan, how would you like to give out Bibles 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year at the rate of 2.2 Bibles per second? I knew I had to become a Gideon. Praise God, he can still use me, a retired old chicken farmer. Thank you very much for your attention today. We have a video. Uh, Linda and I went to uh, the Gideon International Convention in Grapevine, Texas this year, and we got to hear this man speaking personally. It's a moving testimony of how God used one of these Bibles. Thank you very much for your attention this morning. Thank you. What a joy and a privilege it is to stand before you. This room is filled with my heroes. That's right. Gideons are my heroes. Now, I know that for many, uh, athletes and actors and movie stars are their heroes but for me Gideons are my heroes and let me tell you why I'm sure most of you know exactly where you were on September 11th what we call 9-11 when the Twin Towers were attacked in New York City I know exactly where I was I was on my college campus I had just graduated high school and begin my college journey and I remember standing there and watching the big screen as the towers were hit and I remember it doing something to my heart and I called my mom and I said mom I'm gonna sign up for the military and I'm gonna go to war and my mom said what every mom in this room would say she said no you're not I said yes I, I have decided I, I'm going to uh, sign up for the Marine Corps I'd never uh, thought which branch of service I just knew that they were the first to fight and I liked their uniforms and so that's what I did I signed up for the Marine Corps I went down to Paris Island and very quickly was wondering what in the world did I get myself into but after graduating boot camp and and getting in the Corps I became a machine gunner in the Marine Corps and I was put into a what they call a map platoon, a mobile assault platoon. What that simply means is that we didn't have a base. We were our own base. We were a mobile base. And so we could go anywhere and train to do anything, which I was in the Marine Corps at a very dangerous time and served in a very dangerous place in Fallujah. You remember the fighting that was going on there. It was very dangerous at the time. It was so dangerous that where we were that many times they would just airdrop us our food. Uh, they couldn't bring it out because it was too dangerous for them to get to where we were. Matter of fact, I saw a chaplain one time who was brave enough to come where we were and his 
and his vehicle got hit by improvised explosive device and we never saw chaplains again. We were in a very dangerous place. But I'll never forget when I boarded the bus to head to uh, the, the transport for the plane that I was going to get on to go overseas to fight in Iraq. I'll never forget that as I boarded that bus, there was a man standing leaning up uh, on the bus with a cane and he was an older man and he was handing out testaments. Uh, he was handing out these little little Bibles and, and I, I, I got one myself and I thought, well, that's neat. That's pretty cool right there. I uh, love the size and love the color and matched our uniforms. And I, I thought something very other was interesting. It fit perfectly right inside of my left breast pocket of my uniform. So I took that testament and I just placed it there in my left breast pocket as a good luck token and maybe that it would uh, bring me great success and bring me back home. And so I just placed it there. Didn't think I would ever have a chance or an opportunity to read it. Well, I, as I told you, I was in a very dangerous place. They told us before we left that everyone wouldn't come home. And um, hearing those words, most people would not want to go if you knew that your chances of coming home were very slim. But I'll just be honest with you. I never thought it would be me. I never thought that I would get hurt. I never thought that I would get injured. I really thought that I would be just fine. But it did happen to me. In August of 2006, I was shot in the chest by a sniper, 7.62 armor round to the chest. If there's any military families or men in this room, you're thinking to yourself, you are a miracle. And ladies and gentlemen, I am a miracle. I'll never forget when I was shot in the chest and I was laying there in the sands of, of Iraq I remember all I could do was look up and I begged God right there that he would spare my life. I didn't ask him to spare my life because I was afraid to die. I asked him to spare my life because I knew I wasn't ready to stand before God. I knew I needed to get some things in order. I knew I just wasn't ready. They were unable to get me air support to get me to any kind of medical care because of the sandstorms that were of that day, so they had to ground medevac me, which took a lot of time, and, and it was a long process to get me there. I, I'll never forget when they began to work on me when they finally got me to Fallujah Hospital. I remember that one of the officers said, this man's a miracle, because I had, even though I had sustained the injuries to my chest, I had no internal bleeding. The Lord had certainly heard my prayer. I was there uh, in Fallujah Hospital. When you think about a, a hospital, you, you're thinking of a, a, a room with a TV and air condition. That's not the hospital that I was in. I was pretty much in a makeshift tent. Didn't have any visitors, didn't have no TV, didn't have no telephone. I was there all alone. And I'll never forget that one of my Marines um, he came and visited me. Now you got to understand something. We were a mobile assault platoon. We didn't go back to base. We didn't work from base. We were our own base. The only time we got to go to the base was if we got injured, we got killed, or our vehicles got hit by an explosive device and it needed to get repairs. One of my Marines, his vehicle got hit by a roadside bomb and he was coming back in to get vehicle repairs. Well, he knew that I was there and he would have a few days there. And, and, and so he was a good old country boy from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And so he bought a good old watermelon off of a Iraqi. And, and uh, he knew that he was going to see me. And he wanted to put a smile on my face. And I don't know about you. If you're in any kind of hot weather, all it takes to put a smile on your face is a good old watermelon with a little bit of salt. Amen. All the country people in here know exactly what I'm talking about. And he did. He came walking in with that watermelon, grinning ear to ear. I'll never forget his words to me. He said, man, you are so lucky to be alive. And I said, you're right, buddy. I sure am. We had a good time. We ate that watermelon together. He walked out of that room, and that's the last time I was ever able to see him. One week later, he was shot by a sniper and killed instantly in Iraq. 
And I'll just be honest with you, my heart was broken. I, I entered into the lowest point of my life. Again, I'm in a hospital room with no one to talk to, no one there, in isolation, injured. My fellow Marines are out fighting, getting hurt, injured, and dying, and I can do nothing about it. I was in the lowest point of my life. At that point, I had never experienced depression, but I had come to the lowest of lows where I didn't care if I lived or if I died. Not only was I in a pit of depression, I was in a pit of sin. My life was not being lived in the, in, in the way that it should have been lived. I was in a pit of depression and a pit of sin. And at that moment, I remember that little Testament Bible that I had. Only thing in my room was my, my, my uniform sitting next to me. And I thought to myself, I wonder if that testament is there. And I reached over to where my uniform was, and I reached into that, my left breast pocket, and, and there it was. I, I know many times people wonder why these little Gideon testaments have the Psalms and the Proverbs in it. And it doesn't have all the Old Testament. It just has all the New Testament and the Psalms and Proverbs. Well, I'm here to tell you the reason why it's got pro Psalms in there is because of me. I opened that Bible and I began to read reading. I didn't have anything else to do. I was at the lowest point of my life and I, I came to the book of Psalms in chapter 40 and I, I read about a man named David who was in a pit of depression, in a pit that he couldn't get out of. He was not only in a pit of depression, but he was in a pit of sin. And I, I started reading in Psalms chapter 40, verse 1 through 3, and he said, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard my cry, and he brought me up out of the pit, out of the miry clay, and he set my feet upon a rock, and he established my steps. He, he put a new song in my heart. Praise be to God. Many people will see it in fear and will trust in the Lord. And I just thought, Lord, if you can do that for David, surely you can do it for me. And right there in the room, Jesus changed my life forever. I'm sure that there's some Gideons and pastors in this room that maybe you're thinking, Lord, am I doing enough? Is, is, am I truly making a difference? Let me tell you something. I am living proof. That old man who was standing next to that bus that day, handing out those Bibles, he may have thought to himself, am I really making a difference? Yes, you are. I may never meet that man again, this side of glory, but I can tell you something, the Testament changed my life. And I'm telling you, this world is in great need. I don't have to tell you that. This world is in trouble and it's in great need. We don't need another president. We don't need another politician. We don't need another person. All we need is the Word of God. That's what this world needs. So you need to keep on going on like you've never gone before. Give like you've never given. Serve like you've never served. Pray like you've never prayed. God is going to use you. Listen, the Marine Corps gave me a purple heart, but thanks be to God, he gave me a brand new heart. Thank you. Thank you. What a joy. Wow. That's uh, pretty powerful. The seed of the word lives and abides forever. Ah. Wow. But I don't know about you, but I want to give toward that. I remember when we uh, made one of our trips to Uganda, and we, I don't know, man, we took literally hundreds of Bibles, and we began to pass those Bibles out. Uh, wow. Wow. I've never 
seen emotion like I saw then. We began to hand men and women Bibles that had never owned a Bible before. They had bits and pieces of the gospel. They, many of them were believers. They had heard the gospel. They had made Jesus Lord, but they didn't have a Bible. And everybody we gave a Bible to grabbed that Bible and held it and wept. That was a life changer for me. Yeah, how many Bibles did we have? How much access did we have to everything? But it's the Word of God that changes us. It's the Word of God that gives us hope. And we have been blessed so much in this land to have the Word, to hear the Word, to have access to it. And still, many times, we ignore it. But there are those that are in need, and we can offer hope. So I'm going to ask the ushers if you will gather once again, and we're going to receive a special offering for the Gideons. Make your checks out to the church, and we will, we will give them a, a check from the church. And if you have a desire to get involved with the Gideons, if you will just visit with Brother Chester after the service, I'm sure that he can inform you as to what you can do. And uh, we want to make a difference. You have some uh, flyers to pass out. All right. Okay. Awesome. Oh, that's awesome. All right. Everybody make a note. Gideons dot org make a decision to be a blessing and to make a difference amen father thank you for your love for us jesus you are the word and you became flesh and you dwelt among us and we have access to you today because of this word i just declare that your blessing will be upon every gift and every giver today as we plant this seed for your kingdom, so that your kingdom may increase. We thank you, Lord, for the privilege we have of giving today in this ministry. We declare it, we receive it in Jesus' name. Amen. Worship the Lord as you give. God bless you. Wow. God is good. Amen. Amen. Wow. Thank you, Brother Chester, for sharing your heart today. I encourage you, if you can, I'm sure when you get online with thegideon.org, you can hear many different testimonies. I've heard some amazing testimonies of what just the simplicity of a Bible being located in the right place at the right time has changed the lives of individuals. God is so good to us. All right, I'm going to ask you, if you will, to stand together. I'm just going to take a few minutes. We're not going to go very deep and very long today, but we're going to share some things with you, I think, that can be life-changing. Thank you, Lord. I want to share this word, Ezekiel chapter 33, beginning with verse number 31. We began last Sunday talking to you about the dangers of the digital. We talked about the shallowness of this generation. And we're going to continue that just a little bit today and plant some seed for something we're going to pick up next week. But I want you to listen to these words, and then we're going to pray again. Ezekiel 33, 31 says, So they came to you as, a pe as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. They hear your words, 
but they do not do them. Father, we ask today that you speak to our hearts. We ask for your word to be planted deep into our spirit so that we can receive the truth of your word and be changed by it. We ask you to stir our hearts, stir our desire for you. So not only can we just talk about you, but we can live like you. We can be victorious and overcomers in this life. I ask you today to speak to every one of our hearts and change us and make us more like you than we've ever been. And I ask it in Jesus' name. If you agree with that, say amen. All right, you can be seated. It's one thing to have access to the Word, and it's another thing to hear it and do it. It's one thing to be able to hear, to be able to read the Word, but it's another thing to be able to act upon it in obedience. How many of you brought your paper Bible today? I uh, shared last week the importance of being able to focus when we study the Word, hear the Word, whether we're listening to that Word, whether we're reading it off of our phone, or whether we're hearing somebody preach the Word, we need to become very disciplined so that we can focus and hear with our spirit, not with just our brain. And so I talked to you a little bit about the distractions that come when we are caught up in the digital world. In the digital world, we have the convenience, we have the resource, and thank God for that. I think there's such benefit in that. But we also realize that we are living in a world that has the tree of knowledge of good and evil. That means that we have access to the good, but we also have access to the evil. And Satan's job is to, uh, to distract us so that we will not hear the word that is life-changing, but we will be distracted by all the stuff that's in the world. And so when you're studying your Bible, and it's not just a New Testament that you can open and read, but it is your phone, it is your iPad, your computer, and we have so many notifications set up because we don't want to miss anything. We are people of the inquiring minds. We want to know. We want to know, have knowledge of everything. And so I need to inform you that there are 7 billion people in the world. And you really don't need to know everything about every one of them. But it seems like there are times we act like we do. We want to know everything. And so we we begin to study our Bible, and we begin to, you know, we can have a time of devotion or, or whatever you're doing, but you want to just hear from the Lord, you want to increase, you want to become close to Him, and you'll open up your, your digital device, and you begin to read the Bible, and you've got 26 translations you can look at, you can do all the, the, com, the, 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 the comment of everybody and everybody's opinion about all of it, you can start studying and then it never fails, you're going to get a Facebook notification. How many of you are guilty of that happening to you? Raise your hand. Yeah. And for some reason, you have this, this desire. I've got to read that notification. I've got to know what that person is saying. And so you're distracted from studying the Word, and you open up your Facebook page, and you read this stupid comment that has no value whatsoever, which leads you to the next comment, which leads you to the next comment, and then somebody's birthday. And then you get your news notification. And you open up that page and you begin to read. And then instead of getting falling in love with Jesus, you're getting mad. Distractions. You see, Satan has not changed his tactics one bit. In the garden, he became a major distraction by causing people to think 
upon things that they should not think upon. And he began to plant seed in the mind of Adam and the woman. And he said, uh, has God said? Did God really mean what he said? And then thoughts and imaginations come and then distractions come. And because of that, now then, we're no longer focused on what God said. We're focused on our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, our wants, our feelings, everything that we're going through. We are caught up in another world, and we push God out of our way of thinking. And then we push God out of our way of living. And as a result of that, throughout this generation, the generation of people that call themselves believers have become very shallow in their walk with God. Their hunger for God has become a form. It's become a ritual. It's become a routine. Living a lifestyle of defeat, shouting on Sunday, saying amen and praising the Lord on Sunday, but on Monday they're depressed. They're worried. They're living in fear. They're not able to obey God because they have not consumed the truth into their spirit. They've heard it in their mind, but they have not been changed by it. That's the world we live in, a shallow generation, a generation that wants everything instantly. We want everything to be convenient. And then when the trials come, we don't have any knowledge with understanding that we can act upon that will give us victory. And there's some reasons for that. We read that in Ezekiel chapter 33. They hear but they don't do. That's Ezekiel. They hear, but they don't do. Because when they hear, it sounds good. I mean, he says something like this, you are to them a lovely song, a one that has a pleasant voice and can play well an instrument. It, our, the, the declaration of the Word of God becomes something that is soothing, that makes us just feel good, but it doesn't change who we are. Wow. Wow. And then, of course, you know my favorite scripture. James 1, fits perfectly. He said, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourself. So if you hear the word and don't do the word, you deceive yourself. If you're deceived, you think you're right when you're actually wrong. And if you think you're right when you're actually wrong, you keep doing the same thing over and over again, thinking you're right, but you're wrong. You're deceived. And what happens then, we, we develop a form of godliness that denies the power. We go through our religious routine, and we realize that we can feel good when we're with God's people. We feel good when we're worshiping. We feel good when we're praising. We feel good when we're sitting here hearing the Word preached, but it becomes a connection that is a feeling instead of a revelation. But when you fall in love with who Jesus is, everything changes. When you fall in love with Him, your desire for God becomes a driving force. It becomes a hunger because you know that when He speaks to your heart, He gives you life. And then you realize that He can live in you. He dwells in you. By His Holy Spirit, we become the temple, the dwelling place of God. And if He lives in me, if He's in me, in Him I live, in Him I move, and in Him I have my being. And greater is He that is in me than he that lives in the world. Then that means I can be an overcomer. I can be victorious in life. But you have to go beyond a shallow experience. It has to be a driving force. Jesus talks about hunger. He talks about if you hunger and thirst after righteousness, you're going to be filled. But Satan's job is to distract us. So let's look at Mark 4, chapter 4, verse 16, says this. says, These likewise are the ones sown on stony ground, who when they hear the word, immediately receive it with gladness. And they have no root in themselves. And so endure only for a time. Afterward, when tribulation or persecution arises for the word's sake, immediately they stumble. I'm amazed at how many people attend church faithfully, but they can't live in victory. Because they are hearing the word and they are receiving the word. They rejoice in what they hear, but the word is not allowed to become a part of them. They receive it with gladness, but it doesn't take root. 
We have to allow the Word of God to take root because it doesn't produce until it becomes a part of who we really are. Tribulation comes. It's going to happen. Persecution is going to come. In this world, you will have tribulation. Jesus said it. But he said, be of good cheer because I have overcome. And you've got to get the overcomer in you before you can become an overcomer. A shallow generation. So, if Satan's job is to distract, He's pretty good at it, especially when you have access to the information superhighway. We have access to many things that can distract us. You can hear all of the different opinions and comments about everything, every event going on in the world, and you can spend your whole life being distracted, or you can lay it down and look to Jesus. You can acknowledge Him in your life. You can make Him number one. You can make Him first in your life. So, there's a scripture in the Song of Solomon. We use this for our marriage seminar, but it applies to our walk with God. Song of Solomon, chapter 2, verse 15 says, Catch us the foxes the little foxes that spoil the vines. For our vines have tender grapes. Foxes, little foxes. The purpose of the fox is the little fox, they sneak into your vineyard. The vineyard being the place where you produce the fruit of the Spirit. You display a lifestyle of faith. You display a life of victory, of overcoming. You know it's called love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and long-suffering and faith. We've got those things growing in our world. That is the place that we need to live as believers. But distractions come. The little foxes come as distractions that spoil the vines. They, they destroy the fruit. So the world can't see Jesus living in us. They see us involved in our emotions. They see us involved in our struggle. They see us involved in our depression and our fear and our worry. And so they can't see Jesus. They cannot be born again because they don't want what we have because what we have is not given victory. Somebody said amen to that. Wow. So, the Lord willing, next week I'm going to begin a series that is going to just kind of transition from this understanding of distractions. And it's just going to be, I'm going to be talking about the little foxes. Little foxes that spoil the vine. I want you to make note right now in your paper Bible or your phone or whatever you're using. By the way, our Wednesday night teaching is online on our app, so you can pull the notes up from that. So make sure you're here Wednesday. If you're not here, make sure you open it up. Make note, there's some foxes that we're going to deal with, and the first fox we're going to talk about is called fear. The second fox we're going to talk about is called apathy. Apathy. And then we're going to talk about another fox called double-mindedness. These are things that steal the fruit. They stop us from living the life of victory. Then I've got a good name for the next one. It's called sloth. Sloth. S-L-O-T-H, in case you don't know how to spell that. Sloth. That's going to be a good one. Another fox is called envy. And then one that is very important to deal with is called sinful speech. These are foxes that actually steal the fruit of our life so others cannot see Jesus living in us. And we're going to talk about the little foxes so Kind of keep that in mind. 
I know you're going to love it. A shallow generation is a generation that serves God from afar off. They, they don't sell out. They live a life that makes them feel good. It's all about what I can get. We use God for our benefit. We use God for the things that we need, we want, we desire. And, and, and it's all about us instead of being about the kingdom. But when it comes to commitment, it's very difficult. The book of John, chapter 6, verse 65, John 6, 65, Jesus said, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted to him by my Father. And then it says, From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Wow. Jesus is requiring from us a complete turnaround, a repentant heart, a heart that is willing to change. And when we do that, we can follow him wherever he goes, no matter where he goes. But sometimes we get into that point where we have to commit everything, and there's some things we just don't want to let go of. And if we don't want to let go of them, we can't follow him because you have to lay aside every weight and every sin that easily ensnares us. And in doing that, when you make a decision to do that, you have complete victory. Ephesians 4 says it this way, verse 14, he says, there's a plan that God has for us that we grow up into maturity where we are no longer children. No longer children tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. It said, it's just simply letting us know that Satan's tactics have not changed. He is still here to deceive us and to distract us from our focus to get us caught up in all the affairs of life to the point that we're chasing the things that have no eternal value instead of looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And here is a declaration that I believe we need to hear in Romans chapter 12. You see, the shallow generation has no deep convictions. It's if it feels good, do it. It is whatever Kesara, sara. No focus, no plan. But in Romans 12, verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice. Now, why does he say that? It's, he said that because your body is out of control. Your body has desires that will be, be destructive if you let your body do what your body wants to do. So what does he say? Your body must be sacrificed. That means you must be bring yourself under subjection to the will of God so you can follow God. It's called being a disciple, being a disciplined one. Present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is a reasonable service. And then he said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So the key to not being shallow is letting your mind be transformed by the hearing of the Word. When you hear the Word, you receive the Word, the Word becomes a part of you. You get your mind in line with God. You take on the mind of Christ. So he said, don't be conformed to the world, but do this instead. Be transformed. You be transformed. Spirit, soul, and body. Be transformed by getting your mind renewed to what God says. And you cannot get your mind renewed unless you pursue the Word. We have to become students of the Word. We have to become pursuers of the Word. And once you get the Word in you, then when the temptations come, instead of yielding to temptation, the Word will come out of you. But if it's not in you, it won't come out of you. And the tempter is going to tempt you until the day you die. So you might as well get the word in you so you can be a victor over temptation and not be overwhelmed by the circumstances of life that could pull you down or destroy you. If you get your mind transformed, get your mind renewed, 
He says, then you can know the will of God. It's good, acceptable, and it's perfect. You can know God's will for your life. Too many people live their lives not knowing what God's plan is. I'm going to tell you right now what God's plan is for you right now. Everyone that's listening and everyone that's in this room, you can know the will of God for your life right now. Are you ready? I mean, this is His plan for your future. It's, plan for, it's His plan for your past. It's His plan for your present. You can know His will. His will is what I just read to you. Get your mind renewed. And if you get your mind renewed, my plan, God's plan for my life today is that no matter what I'm going through, I am to be transformed by causing my mind to hear what He's saying to me today. Don't worry about tomorrow. God's will for you tomorrow will be perfect if you stay in His will today. His will today is this. He said you can know the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God when you get your mind renewed. And you get your mind renewed, you're going to be transformed into His image. You'll be in His will at all times. Whether you're in Texas or you're in Uganda, it doesn't matter where you are. You'll be in His will. Proverbs 16, 3. Commit your works to the Lord. Commit your works to the Lord. I'm here to tell you, here's your answer. Commit your works to the Lord. Commit your works to the Lord. What's going to happen? And your thoughts will be established. Where is our problem? It's what we think. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down thoughts and imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of Christ, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Our warfare is right here. But he said, if you'll submit to him, surrender to his will, commit your works to him, let go of all of your stuff and make him the priority of your life, he says, when you do that, then your thinking is going to be established. You're not going to have this war in your mind every day. The war that we fight with our mind, we need to win once and for all. Because Jesus paid the price to make you a new creation for your spirit, your soul, and your body. You are a victor. You're not a victim. I don't care how bad your life has been, God's able to heal you in an instant. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you've done wrong, no matter what others have done to you, in a moment's time, the power of Jesus Christ that was given to us at Calvary, that blood, the blood of his covenant, removes the authority of every hurt, every feeling, every emotion, every problem that we've ever faced and gives us peace and gives us understanding and gives us a revelation that God loves me just as I am. And all I have to do is let go and let God be the king. Let him be the Lord of my life and let him order my steps from this day forward and everything changes. And it is that simple. How can it be? It is just that simple because you're not saved by your works. You're not saved by what you do. You're not saved by your goodness. You are saved by believing. You're saved by believing that God loves you. You're saved by believing that Jesus died for you. You're saved by believing that he came out of the grave so that you can live and you can be free. And if you believe that, then you're free. So don't let the foxes steal the fruit. Learn to live a life that is committed to him. And when you commit everything to him, then you find out you're going to win this battle right here. There's no weapon formed against me that can prosper. Every tongue that has risen against me in judgment, I condemn. That's his promise. What does that mean? You're not condemning people. You're condemning the words, the authority of words that have been spoken against you. I believe we need to hear this today. We need to realize God has given you and I the ability to destroy the authority of every word that's been spoken against us. No matter who said it, doesn't matter. 
The power of those words are broken. You are not who those words say you are. You are who Jesus says you are. In Him you live. In Him you move. In Him you have your being. So break the stronghold of every soulish tie of your past that was not of God. Break the stronghold of every past experience that you've been involved in that was not of God. And let the blood of Jesus sever that relationship, sever that fear from your past, and give you freedom in Christ. God loves you. Now that's the good news I've got for you today. Let's stand together. Wow. We're going to catch some foxes. We're going to set traps. We're going to catch a bunch of foxes. Ooh. And the grapes are going to grow. And the fruit is going to be there. And our lives are going to be victorious. Everybody just close your eyes right now. Wait in his presence for just a moment. God loves you so much. I want you to know this. God loves you. He is not against you. He does not condemn you for anything you've ever done. He loves you just as you are. And he wants to give you freedom to enjoy your life. And that freedom comes by his grace. And his grace comes to you when you choose to believe that he loves you. You can't change his love. He's going to love you no matter what you do. But he just wants you to know that he loves you. And because he loves you, you can be free from bondage. You can be free from fear. You can be free from the past. You can be free from depression. You can be free from worry. You can be free because he loves you. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, so that whoever believes on him can have everlasting life. And once you have that life, you are victorious over every circumstance in this life. Father, thank you right now for speaking to our hearts. We need to know you. This word that is being presented around the world, thank you, Father, for the Gideons. Thank you, Father, for the heart and the desire. But, Lord, we want to say thank you right now for our opportunity to have heard and received this word even today. We acknowledge you. We give our hearts, we give our lives to you. I want everyone now just to say these words. Say, dear Jesus, thank you for loving me. I make a decision right now to give my heart to you. To completely let go of everything in my past and turn away from it and make you Lord of my future. I surrender to your will. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for loving me. And thank you for setting me free. This day, you are my Lord. You are my Savior. And I am a new creation. And I am an overcomer because of the good news. And I receive it in Jesus' name. Amen.